And for those who haven't joined any of the other lectures, my name is Veronica Huber, and I have organized this webinar series together with Lukas Gudmundsen, who will um, moderate uh, today's session. And but so I will, um, we are very happy to have today's speakers with us, um, Benjamin Sultan. He is senior scientist at the French Research Institute for Sustainable Development. And he has recently contributed to the sixth assessment report of the IPCC. And he has worked extensively on climate impact on agriculture and crop production systems in West Africa. He has also some expertise on climate dynamics, Western African monsoon in the region. And he has um, in 2019 published a really nice paper on attributing uh, past changes in crop production in West Africa to climate change. And this is why he's here. And we are very much looking forward to uh, hearing a bit more about this study. But now it's time to hand over to Benjamin. So yeah, welcome once again. Thank you, uh, Veronica. And thank you, Lucas, for the, for the invitation. And hello, everyone. So uh, I'm Benjamin Sultan from uh, IRD, the French Research Institute for Development. And, and I will uh, try to share my screen. So let me know if it's okay for you. Works well, thanks. Okay, good. So um, as uh, I said, I, I will present a, a study and uh, an, attrib an attribution study we have done um, with different colleagues, with uh, Dimitri de France and uh, Toshi Izumi from Japan. Uh, a study based in, uh, in, uh, in West Africa, an attribution study, where we try to, uh, to, uh, to put some evidence of crop production losses due to a historical global warming using uh, two crop models. So while studying in West Africa, Africa is particularly exposed to climate variability and to climate change. We have one third of the population facing widespread hunger and facing malnutrition. You have rural households whose livelihood is heavily dependent on traditional rain-fed agriculture. And uh, you have also, in addition to this, to these different constraints, you have climate change, which is an, uh, an additional uh, constraint in achieving food security goals in the region, especially when the population is rapidly increasing. In fact, climate change is, uh, is really a trait in the region, and we expect a significant warmer climate in the future. You have here results from the, the, the previous semi five exercise, which is uh, the map is the, the multimodal uh, uh, mean for summer temperature under the RCP 4.5 scenario, which is a moderate emission scenario indeed. And it's an average of more than 20 climate models of the last uh, semi five uh, exercise, which was used for the previous uh, IPC report. And this map shows differences in temperature between the future and an historical climate. And you can see in the map uh, a, a large increase of temperature, especially in the West Africa and the Sahel, where we could expect an increase of temperature between two and three degrees Celsius. And this expected uh, warming may lead to negative impacts on crop yields. And there are several papers that have shown that higher temperatures could shorten crop cycle length and could also increase water stress, which is detrimental for crop production with less yields and more variability in the future. As an example, this study shows the distribution of crop yield anomalies of millet and sorghum in West Africa relative to a 30-year historical period in the present and uh, uh, the pre uh, period in the future. And millet and sorghum are uh, the, the, the main food, st uh, the main staple food crop in West Africa. So they are really important for food security. And uh, these anomalies are given from a crop model, which is able to simulate crop yields in response to uh, climate fluctuations. So you, what you can see from these two distribution with present and future distribution is that in the future, the distribution of uh, yield uh, 
anomalies is shifted uh, toward the lower yields with a mean loss of about 10% and with a larger distribution, which means that uh, we expect more variable yields under climate change. And here is another example of the response of crop yield to warmer climate. We use kind of the same climate models to force a crop model to look at the response of this warming in terms of crop yield, but for maize in West Africa. So we have also um, uh, reported in the in this uh, in this graph in orange the, the 20 worst years in the FAO data uh, in anomaly compared to a 30 uh, year recent period. So the the, the orange box uh, is the, the the 20 worst years we have observed in the recent uh, data. And what you can see from this uh, graph is that the response of crop yield depends on the amplitude of the warming. If we could limit global warming to one degree, uh, point, uh, 1.5 degrees Celsius, and there are no clear negative or no clear positive impacts on crop yields because there are a lot of variability in, in, uh, in climate model with some models simulating an increase of rainfall, some other a decrease. And, uh, but if you increase uh, the, the, the global warming to two degrees Celsius, we can see a clear negative uh, impact with the gray box. And uh, if you increase the, the warming by uh, four uh, degrees Celsius, we could expect a large, very large negative impact, nearly uh, near minus 40% uh, compared to the historical period. And these impacts are far larger than the recent uh, crop yield losses in the FAO data. So we could expect a uh, really important impact, uh, unexpected impact, uh, unseen impact that uh, uh, what we project in the future. But uh, climate warming is not only in climate models and not only in future scenarios, but it is also visible in uh, climate observations. In the last IPCC report, there are regional fact sheets which summarize what we have already observed in terms of climate change around the world. And here is an example of the African fact sheet that highlights that mean temperatures and hot extremes have emerged above natural variability in the old lands uh, in Africa, and the rate of surface temperature increase. Uh, generally more rapidly in Africa than in the global average, with all, uh, already uh, some kind of attribution with human-induced climate change being the dominant driver of this increase of temperature. And we also observe increase in hot extremes in heat waves, but also decrease in cold extremes, including uh, cold waves. And it is projected to continue uh, in the in the future with the increase of uh, temperature and the, the, the increase of emission uh, greenhouse gases emission. We have here the observation of temperature in the Sahel since uh, 1950 during the hottest months uh, during uh, the, the months of April to June, which is before the, the, the monsoon season, so before the, the, the summer. These are the, 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 the warmest uh, months. And uh, on the bottom of the plot, you have the annual mean, the year mean of the, the, the temperature. And what you can see is that the, the temperature is increasing very fast in, uh, in the Sahel, especially during the hottest months in April, where there is a, a plus 1.4 degrees uh, Celsius increase of temperature since 1950. And when you consider the observed annual temperature, the Sahel has warmed by plus one degree, uh, 1.1 degree Celsius since 1950, and plus 2.1 degree Celsius since 1850. So there is a clear warming. And now the question is, has climate change, is climate change, is observed uh, increase of temperature already started to affect agriculture? And in fact, it's not an easy question for at least two reasons. First, when you look at crop productivity, the time series or at food security events, there is also a lot of variability and trends that are not due uh, to management changes, 
and that are due to uh, other uh, that are due to uh, to other factors than climate. You have uh, management changes. You have uh, different factors. You have also political crises that could affect crop productivity, crop production, and food security, and which could be completely independent of climate change. And the second reason is that there is a lot of natural variability in historical climate, climate in the region, which could affect crop yield and which does not belong to anthropic global warming. For instance, you can have drought, you can have uh, heavy rains that could just belong to natural variability and not to climate change. As an example of such climate variability in Africa, you have here two recent climate extremes in Africa that we have observed, which uh, had a strong impact on food security. And those two events, those two events were reported in the, by the World Weather Attribution Initiative. The, uh, the, the first one is the south of Madagascar, which was facing a severe food crisis exacerbated by exceptionally low levels of rainfall over two years, 2020 and 2021. However, an attribution analysis based on past data and climate simulation concluded that factors other than climate change were the main drivers of this food insecurity and the low levels of rainfall belonging to natural variability of climate in the region. The other example is the extreme rainfall we observed, which affected uh, Madagascar also, Mozambique and Malawi with severe flooding. And this time the attribution study concluded that we can reasonably say that climate change has increased the probability of occurrence of such uh, tropical cyclones and also their amplitude, hitting highly vulnerable communities in Madagascar, in Mozambique and in Malawi. So you have this high, this context of very high variability of climate with flood, with drought, that could belong or not uh, to natural variability. So in, uh, to answer the, the, our question and assess what are the historical impacts of human activities in West Africa, we designed a modeling experiment with two components. Uh, first, a climate component to simulate factual and non-factual climate, which means that climate with or without anthropic influence uh, of the increase of, of greenhouse gases emission. And then we have a second component on crop modeling. We use a crop model forced by this factual climate or this non-factual climate to assess uh, if anthropic warming has already affected crop yield. So by simulate, by simulating factual yield or non-factual yield. So I'll go into detail with the different uh, modeling component. First, the climate simulation component. We use the Meteorological Research Institute Atmospheric uh, General Circulation Model, which is an atmospheric GCM forced by sea surface temperature. And the model was used for two kinds of simulation. First, factual climate simulation, which are actual climate conditions that are influenced by both human activities and natural forces. So we have in this uh, simulation, observed change in the sea surface temperature, in sea ice, in greenhouse gases concentration, in ozone, in anthropogenic aerosol burdens, in volcanic uh, sulfate aerosol loading, in natural aerosol loading. Uh, everything is considered in this factual climate simulations to have a highly realistic climate simulation. And then we have a second type of simulation, the counterfactual climate simulation, which is non-warming counterfactual climate simulation representing a pre-industrial climate that lacks human influences on uh, global climate systems. So it's, it's like the, the climate we should have if uh, the human influence, if we don't have any influence, any human influence on climate. So here the sea surface temperature and sea ice are both detrended to uh, have uh, the, the climate that we have with greenhouse gases concentration in 8050, 
the anthropogenic aerosol and volcanic aerosol in 1850 and the ozone concentration in 1961. So that's it for the counterfactual climate simulation. And for those two kinds of simulation, we have 60 years of the atmospheric GCM uh, with daily outputs from 1951 to 2010. And it has been now recently extended to uh, 2019, but not uh, taken into account for this duty. And we have 100 uh, ensemble members in the simulation for each type of the simulation. So in total, we have 200 uh, simulations in order to sample the internal variability of the model. So the atmospheric GCM data were interpolated onto a 0 0.5 degrees grid by using uh, the inverse distance weighted method. And uh, since we want to use it for uh, climate impacts, we had to remove biases of the climate uh, model outputs. So we applied a bias correction technique, which is the cumulative distribution function based downscaling method by using as a reference, as the observation reference, the S14 forcing data for the 40 year period, 1961 to 2000. And it has been done for several variables that are important for impact studies. So daily mean and maximum and minimum temperature, precipitation, relative humidity, wind speed, surface pressure, but also a radiation flux, short wave radiation and long wave radiation, and specific humidity. And for this study, radiation flux data were estimated from the AGCM simulated total cloud cover and then bias corrected and specific humidity data were cal calculated using bias corrected relative humidity, daily mean temperature and surface pressure. You have here the, the annual mean surface temperature time series in different continents, North, South America, in Europe, in Africa, in Asia, in Australia. And the black line is the observation, the S14 uh, uh, observation. And you have simulations of the model in pink, in pink and uh, orange for historical simulation and in purple for uh, counterfactual simulation. So what you can see from this different time series is that the model matches observation with the factual simulation. So you can see that the, the orange or the, the, the pink simulation are very close to the observation, but the, the counterfactual simulation is far colder than the observation. So what you have in purple, it's very cold compared to the observation. So it's a, the very first step of, the, of an attribution at the, the continental scale. And then this, this simulation has also already been used for impact attribution at the global scale. Using the Sigma crop model, this study by Yuzumi et al. investigated the changes in average yield associated with climate change from pre-industrial levels. And in red, you have the areas where climate change decreased yield, decreased simulated yield, and on the opposite, you have in green the areas where climate change increased yield. I mean that areas that where we get benefit, we got benefits from uh, the increase of greenhouse gases and increase of temperature. And what you can see is that there are areas where, with the production higher because of climate change. And it is the case for the northern, the northern latitude in Europe, in, U, in uh, Russia, or in Canada. But in the tropics, uh, in the opposite, there are regions where the crop yields were, have been affected by climate change, already affected by climate change in Africa in particular, and in Brazil. And overall, we, we got a, a negative global uh, impact of, uh, of, uh, of climate change on global production with a global production loss for maize, wheat, and soybean associated with climate change for the 1981-2010 period that together accounts for more than $42.4 uh, billion per year. So it's quite, quite important uh, by the end. And so even if we have some region where it could be positive, uh, overall we have a negative impact of climate change on crop production. 
So now, and, uh, let's go back to West Africa. So what are the impacts of human activities in the West African climate? So what we have done, we have first computed several user relevant uh, indices, such as the annual mean of temperature, the annual rainfall, but also the number of rainy days, uh, also extreme um, uh, indices such as heavy rainfall events or very heavy rainfall events, which is the number of rainfall a day exceeding uh, 50 millimeters per day. Rainfall intensity, which is the ratio between the annual rainfall and the number of rainy days. Very hot days, the number of days exceeding 30 degrees Celsius. And the onset day, which is the, the, the start of the rainy season, usually in May, June in the region in West Africa, which is the start of the rain season, which could be really important for agriculture in the, in the region. And these uh, indices are part of a longer list that has been established during meetings with stakeholders, discussion with stakeholders in Senegal and in Burkina Faso. And what we have done, we have compared these indices in the factual simulation and in the counterfactual climate simulation to look at if we have, uh, in the rest of the period, if we have uh, some changes between the, the two, some significant changes between the factual and the counterfactual simulation. And uh, in fact, we found that some of those, these indices were significantly uh, different from the two sim between the two simulations. Uh, and it was the case for the annual mean temperature for EV rainfall events for uh, also rainfall intensity and very hot days. So these indices uh, have been affected by the historical evolution of, uh, of greenhouse gases. And we have significantly uh, different uh, simulations in counterfactual and, uh, and uh, counterfactual ones. However, we could not find any uh, significant difference when we look at annual rainfall or the onset of the, of, the, of the rainy season, which could be important variables for agriculture in the region, but we could not find any uh, significant difference. And to show you an example, you have here the time series of annual surface temperature in average over West Africa in the observation from the crew data. And the average over the last 10 years of the simulation is almost 28 uh, degrees uh, per year. And you have uh, here in blue, the counterfactual simulation from the model, which reproduce, reproduces quite well the internal variability of the temperature because it's a forced, uh, it's an at atmospheric forced uh, model. So you have the internal variability, but in fact, we cannot reproduce the trend by the end of the time series compared to observation. And compared to observation, the, the average for the last 10 years is one degree below uh, what we observed uh, from the crew data. And here is the factual simulation with the right evolution of greenhouse gases emission. And uh, we have a much better fit with the observation. We have the internal variability, but now we have the trend, the, 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 the warming trend. Uh, we observed in observation. And uh, you see that the, the average over the last 10 years is very close to the one in the observation, which means that we can really attribute the recent, the recent increase of temperature in the Sahel to human activities. And now you have uh, the different parameters, different variables we have from the model. You have the ensemble mean of simulated counterfactual uh, uh, simulation, which is the thin black uh, curve. You have the standard deviation of the 100 uh, members, which is the gray envelope, and the factual climate simulation uh, in red of the, the different variables of so the mean surface temperature, the annual rainfall, the number of very hot days, and the number of very rainy days. And the thick black, the thick black line, represents the, the observation uh, of the mean annual temperature and the annual rainfall from the crew data. And all values are shown in average across uh, West Africa. And what you can see is that there is a clear signal of anthropic warming 
for mean temperatures, as I shown you previously, but also in the number of very hot days, it's completely different in the red uh, simulation and in the, uh, the counterfactual simulation. And you have also um, uh, a difference in the, the very heavy rains where the, the red simulation is, is above the, the gray envelope. So it means that it's above the internal variability and we could clearly attribute this, this increase of very heavy rains to uh, the increase of anthropic uh, greenhouse gases emission. However, if we look at the total rainfall, it's the it's the figure on the on the right uh, on the upper right. The total rainfall you cannot uh, find find any difference between the, the 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 simulated rainfall with the counterfactual simulation and the and the, the, the factual simulation, which means that the fluctuations in annual rainfall may not be driven by anthropic climate warming in the region. So now that we have identified an effect of uh, anthropic warming on the regional climate in West Africa, the second question we have is, what are the impacts of such changes on crop yields? So to answer this question, we use the atmospheric GCM uh, runs to uh, force two crop models, the, the SARA model and the SIGMA model, over the factual and the counterfactual period by doing 100 uh, runs each. Let me introduce you briefly the, the, the principles of these two crop models. The SARA model has been developed by CIRAD in France and it's combined it combines a water balance model, so simulating the water demand, simulating soil water availability, some stress index, indices, it combines with a carbon assimilation and partitioning model using a radiation use efficiency, phenology concept, and evolution of biomass and leaf area index. And with the model, you can choose the sowing date, and the model is able to grow a plant from sowing to maturity and to give you a yield by the end of the year by considering weather, radiation, and different kinds of, uh, of stresses. And the model has been used several times to simulate millet and sorghum in West Africa. You have here an example of the skill of the model uh, to um, represent the, the, the variability of crop yields in West Africa, the black line on the bottom left uh, uh, graph, uh, the black line represents the observed yield from FAO, and the red line is the simulation of the SARA model in average for millet and sorghum from 1960 to 1990. And observed and simulated yields have been both detrended over time to remove management, management changes and are shown as standardized uh, anomalies. And you can see that the model is able to capture uh, some of the year-to-year -year fluctuations, especially those driven by climate fluctuations, and, which is the case, for instance, for the severe drought in uh, 1984. And one of the advantages of the model is that it is able to capture nonlinear effect of climate on crop yields, and as you can see on the, the, the bottom right of this, uh, this slide, where you have a scatter plot with simulated yield on one side and rainfall on the other side. And, and uh, the yield is increasing in the model with rainfall up to uh, 500 to 600 millimeters per year. And then after, there is kind of a plateau, which means that there are other factors explaining year-to-year -year variability of simulated yield, other factors than, uh, than, uh, than rainfall amount. Now the second model we use is the Sigma model, which has been developed by NARO in Japan which includes much more processes than SAR. Uh, we model the crop development using a fraction of the accumulated growing degree days relative to different crop thermal requirements. We have leaf growth and senescence computed based on the prescribed shape, uh, shape of the, the, the leaf area index and based also on the fraction of the growing season considered. And yields are computed from the level of 
photosynthetically active radiation intercepted by the canopy, the radiation use efficiency level, like the, the SARA model, but also CO2 fertilizer, fertilizer effect and fraction of total biomass. Uh, and also the actual evapotranspiration of the model is derived from a soil water, uh, soil water balance uh, submodel that is coupled uh, with a snow cover submodel, which is not very useful in Africa. And you have in the model five different types of stress. You have nitrogen uh, deficit, and you have heat stress, cold stress, water deficit, and excess water stress that are all considered in the model. And each type of stress is a function of climate and, uh, and apply to have uh, by the end uh, the, the, the simulation uh, yet. And the model uh, uh, nitrogen application rate is simulated according to uh, changes in per capita GDP and per capita agricultural area, which means that we could represent uh, technological improvements over time but uh, not really uh, plan adaptation to climate change. And some dates in the model are modeled to, uh, to shift uh, according to changes in temperature and moisture uh, regions. So these two crop models, SARA and Sigma, were used to simulate, it, to simulate uh, crop yields over factorial and counterfactual period. And we have done 100 uh, runs for each simulation. And we simulated two crops, millet and sorghum, that are the major food staple, uh, staple food crops in, uh, in West Africa. And you have here the, the, the validation of the two crop models, SARA in blue and Sigma in red, against the FAO data. And these are average over the main producing countries in West Africa, with raw data on the left, and uh, on the right, percentage uh, yield anomalies relative to normal yield computed as the, the, the five-year running average. And correlation values are indicated on the top of each panel. And the sigma model, you can see on the, on the, on the left, the sigma model does a good job in, simulated, uh, in simulating uh, mean, and, uh, mean and millet uh, trends. And it also performs well in simulated the, the sorghum trends. It is likely because the model includes a management trend with nitrogen inputs increasing over time. But the SARA model is not able to simulate such trends, but uh, does a better job in, simulated, uh, in simulating anomalies with significant correlation with observation. And these correlations are especially higher if you remove Nigeria from the, this average, from the country producing average. And in fact, we found that Nigeria, which is the first producer of millet and sorghum in, in West Africa, the FAO series, time series of, uh, of, uh, of crop production is almost always flat all along the observed period, which makes us a bit suspicious about uh, this data. This map shows the geographical patterns of average yield impacts in the last decade of the simulation, 2000 uh, and 2009, associated with historical climate change and relative to a non-warming counterfactual condition. So it means that negative values indicate a yield loss due to anthropic warming and the uh, values in green or blue indicate values uh, where you could have a higher impact, higher yields because of climate change. And in fact, you have strong uh, crop yield losses almost everywhere in West Africa in the two crop models and both for millet and sorghum. And the two crop models simulated the highest uh, yield losses in the north of the Sahel where the warming was the most intense. But there are some differences between the two crop models. The impacts are higher with the SAR uh, crop model, likely because its sensitivity to climate change, to climate variability is higher because it does not include management changes or CO2 fertilization.
And you have here the, the, the impacts reported for the main producing countries, Nigeria, Niger, Mali, Burkina Faso, Senegal, and uh, in average for West Africa, for millet, uh, for the two crop models, and for uh, sorghum, for the two crop models. And the losses are uh, quite high. They are estimated between 10 and 18% for millet and uh, between 5% and 15% for sorghum, depending on the crop model we use. But they are all negative. And the losses for some countries could have been uh, bigger, especially if you look at Niger or uh, Mali or Senegal. But it's not always consistent between the two crop models. For instance, you have a large uh, impact um, in Niger, which is consistent in the two crop models, but in Senegal, you have also a large uh, impact, but only in the SARA model. And now if we use um, economic, economic data, if you, if you use a grid cell harvested area and country average producer prices, we could estimate the, the, the damage, the, the cost of this damage due to climate change and the average, the average annual production losses uh, over this, um, this last decade of simulation. And with the SARA model, these losses account for 2.99 billion US dollars for millet and for um, 1.89 billion US dollars for sorghum. And these losses are lower for the Sigma model because the, the sensitivity to climate is also lower. But we also found important uh, damages accounting for uh, 1.65 billion US dollars for millet and for uh, 0.69 billion US dollars for sorghum. So now to conclude, um, we found that uh, there is a significant uh, impact of human activities on the regional climate in the Sahel with a slightly different climate in, uh, in West Africa, a warmer climate. A climate with more extremes, with more heat waves, but also with more intense rainfall. And it, is as, uh, it seems that there are some consequences, already some consequences on agricultural crop production, especially because of this, uh, the, the warming. And without anthropic warming, crop yield would have been higher in West Africa between plus 6% and plus 15% uh, for sorghum, and between uh, plus 11% and plus 18% for millet. And it's, uh, um, it's quite consistent between the two crop models. And we believe that it's a similar effect that drives this, uh, this uh, negative impact. But uh, the amplitude of losses differs from one model to another. The SARA model is much more sensitive than the Sigma model. But uh, we could uh, think that it's a common mechanism that explain uh, this uh, behavior, this common behavior, likely the increased evapotranspiration led water deficit. So the, the, the water stress induced by uh, increased temperature and also the, 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 short -term, the shortening of the crop duration induced by, by uh, the warming, which is quite similar in one model from another. And since the, the, the most optimistic climate change scenario do not lead to warm, warming below 1.5 degrees Celsius. Further crop production losses in West Africa appear to be unavoidable in the future without adaptation. And clearly we need to, uh, to, to increase our knowledge on the most uh, effective adaptation methods uh, to, uh, to mitigate such kind of impacts in the future. So in that, so please uh, have a look to the to the publication for the for more details and I hope it was clear.